Welcome to World Combat Sports. What's going on, everyone? This is Scotty White coming at you again with this boxing and mixed martial arts conversation, media, and everything else you want to add on to it. That's what I'm doing. First and foremost, I want to appreciate all the supporters that tune in to the channel. Um, you know, continue to pass the word so it can, um, you know, cultivate more more supporters, more following, and everything where we talk about multifacets of combat sports. Truly appreciate it. Those of you, those of you in the building, you know, do me a favor and smash that thumbs up for me. It's very little effort with a huge reward. Truly appreciate it. Let's get right down to it. J Rock, <coughs> Jason, <coughs> Jason Rosario. What I'm not trying to understand about this match was that it was anything other than what we saw on TV. I'm going to read you all an article from Boxing Scene um, that pertains to this particular bout. But first, I want to just highlight some things. J-Rock's best round was the first round, in my opinion. And I was trying to build him up, right? When I was doing, you know, live um, commentary, round for round commentary. I was trying to build them up because I really wanted to see, like other people, the J-Rock that fought Jared Hurd. That's what I wanted to see. That's what a lot of people wanted to see. And then the second round came in and Rosario was getting, beginning to land. And he was beginning to land sometimes the left, right, and then the right. And I'm like, he, he's not even putting that much effort into it. And it's early in the fight. It's fresh. You know what I'm saying? The warm-up phase is still active. And I'm saying, I'm saying to myself, no, no. Julian Williams is much better than this. This is what Julian w Williams advocated that he wasn't. Don't discount a fighter just because he was stopped, just because he has one loss. Don't do that. Hearing him say that in the ring after winning the titles, it was a climactic moment. It was one of those... <clears throat> epochs that you look at and say we totally can gravitate to what he's saying because he's a good dude good fighter and he recovered from from a highlight reel he's been subjected with for quite some time and that was the right hand uppercut from jamal charlo each and every time it's played, you know, that's something that people's going to ask him about and everything. And I'm pretty sure he's frustrated. But then there with Rosario, when he started to land in the second round, and then the third round, he's, uh, Rosario was much more active. It seems like William was trying to come on. I say, okay, William's getting his, his rhythm down, his combinations, you know. He's settling in. And this, this one we're going to see the clinic. Because I didn't think Rosario was on – Williams level to be honest and a part of me still feels that way I'm just I'm just keeping it honest the Williams that we seen against her I truly feel that that Williams Rosario wouldn't be able to touch that's just keeping it simple basic straight to the point point no exacerbation that's that's what I feel <clears throat> Then the fourth round come around. You know, all this time I see Julian Williams pawing out a cut. And I took a peek at it, you know, in between rounds to see if it was much more worse than what it seemed like on TV. And it didn't seem that bad. But when you have Rosario con continuing to connect in the same area, you know, it's going to tell you one or two things. That he's accurate. He's being very surgical tonight, or I need to move my head. I need more defense. I need side-to-side -side lateral evasiveness. And it, it didn't seem like that was Julian Williams' MO at the time. It didn't seem like he had a sense of urgency to make that happen with that cut over his eye. And it was in a bad place. It was on top of the lid. So to this, so to the news that I'm hearing about – they want to jump back in there and face J-Rock in a rematch because that cut ain't going nowhere, right? And from what I understand, the cut was 
you know, um, antiquated freaking scar tissue, you know, old residual scar tissue, um, you know, scar tissue, some people it'll affect worse than others, but it really never goes anywhere. Um, it's been fighters that have freaking surgeries to reduce the scar tissue that they have anyway. We were kind of looking forward to the name of Charlo. And they say they're not looking forward to face Charlo. So I'm like, who is that? I don't know who that is. But anyway, <clears throat> let me cut that down. Anyway. Yeah, bear with me right quick, man. So to, to my disappointment and many other people that I was talking to, we was kind of hoping and gambling on the fact that, you know, J-Rock would be out of business for a bit, right? He'd be out of, he'd be out of commission. So we'll, we'll get the unification bout. And really, we want to see a unification with the Charlo brothers, man, especially Jamel Charlo, because he's, he's coming off a fight with Tony Harrison which he redeemed himself. And we was happy to see that. You know what I'm saying? We was happy to see Charlo go in there and redeem himself against Tony Harrison, who was playing around, who who, who was on the mic after the uh, fight, you know, a couple of days later, talking about he'd give his whole paycheck to do. I don't understand that. How can you give your, your paycheck 72 hours after clowning around as if the fight was any less serious when you was in the ring. You was in there to hold on to the WBC title. So therefore, you potentially could have been in the ring with Rosario. Facts. But you wanted to play around and act like you was complacent. Somehow you had a, a lapse in judgment. You was just on a whole nother freaking um, mental dimension that no one knows about. For you to be actually doing pretty good against Charlo. And then start playing to the crowd. We would have liked to seen or heard Rosario and his people say, we would definitely like to unify. We, we would have been all up in arms. We would have said, hell yeah, let's get on the mic, man. Let's go up here to this social media. Let's re uh, create a live stream. Let's talk about it. Let's talk about what we want to see in the junior middleweight division. And it just didn't happen. So... Let me take you to an article. I want to briefly read you an article from Boxing Scene, like I said, about the viewership and why I say it would be a good time for Rosario to face Jamel Charlo. It said Williams and, Ro Williams and Rosario. Fox broadcast peaked 1,565,000 viewers. Not quite as many viewers watched his son Rosario stun Julian Williams on Saturday night. As Saul Williams upset Jerry Hurd to win 354-pound titles eight months earlier. It goes on to say, it indicated an average audience of 1,536,000. Watch Rosario stop Williams in the fifth round of a main event Fox aired from Williams' hometown of Philadelphia. A peaked audience of, of the same that I just mentioned. See Rosario beat Williams, who consistently listed as at least a 30 to 1 favorite to win their scheduled 12 round fight for the IBF, IBO, and WBA Junior Middleweight Championships. Rosario Williams headlined a three bout broadcast that was watched by an average of 1,408,000 viewers combined on Fox. It goes on to say this. Williams' win against Jerry Hurd, a Fighter of the Year candidate in 2019, attracted a peak audience of 2 million plus for Fox on May 11 on Eagle Bank Arena, Arena in Fairfax, Virginia. An average of um, 1,385,000 watched that three fight telecast. So, Hurd and Williams was considered beforehand, however, a more compelling competitive fight than Williams Rosario. So basically, you know, 
Williams Hurd, of course, did better numbers than Williams Rosario because not too many people really knew about Rosario. Let's be honest. I don't care if you're a boxing casual or a boxing purist. Not too many people was tuning in to see Jason Rosario fight Julian Williams. They just thought Julian Williams would go in there. Even, even the arena, if you actually paid, paid attention to the panning of the seat, seating, it was still plenty of empty seats in that arena. He was at home. That just goes to show you how boxing is. You know what I'm saying? Boxing is very finicky with his appetite and some some fighters personality blend in well with the perfect recipe it tastes good no chaser and then you have other fighters who are just strictly prohibited you know off visual man i don't like that i know if i eat that it's an aftertaste you know they have this way like nah that's not just that's not something i just want to put on my favorites list right there I don't want to see that that boxer fight. That's how boxing is, man. It's so much to choose from. It's such a huge decor, especially over here in the U.S., that it's hard for individual fighters who are pretty decent to get the support unless they do something spectacular. They have to do something spectacular. And this is where we at with the tech world. Hit me on this. This is where we at when I when I say fighters have to do something spectacular. They have to do something that's that's considered out of the normal. Somehow, some way, they have to go to social media and find a way to bring attention to themselves. It may be attention in a negative light, or it, or it may be a halo that shines bright. We don't know. Either way it goes, they have to bring attention to themselves in order for the fans to kind of tune in in a different perspective if they didn't watch them fight before. They might know that they're a fighter, but they really wasn't paying attention. So now they have to take the social media and basically create a storm for people to tune in to. They have to create a storyline. They have to create a narrative that's important for everybody to just say, you know what? Let me bookmark this right here. Let me put this in my favorites because I got to check this out. That's the, that's the world we live in right now. Just like Carissa Shields coming off her victory. Like, let's be honest. Before the fight leading up, how do we bring attention to the fight? Well, you want to talk about Amanda Nunez and you going over to the UFC and going in the cage and stuff like that. I have all the, I have all the recordings and everything. Like I was hyped. I was like, you know what? She going over to the to the to the cage to compete in mixed martial arts. That's cool. And then Amanda Nunez come over there, but she wanted Amanda to go over there first. So all this leading up to the fight, it's all over the media. You know, Carissa want to do MMA and all that. And I will be participating. That's what she said. I will be participating in mixed martial arts by the end of 2020. So therefore, after the win, it turns into I don't think Amanda Nunez really wants to fight. You haven't heard too much of anything from Amanda Nunez after the fact. And then fight fans have to understand seriously that if Carissa does cross over, if any male or female boxer cross over, it's, it's not the first time that we've actually seen a boxer cross over the mixed martial arts. It's been going on forever in the day. You might not know the fighters who have did it and currently doing it, but it's nothing new. So you, so you take all the hoopla and, you know, bring that attention because every fighter has his own way of sending out a tweet. They have so many followers and have somebody latch on to that tweet, pasting it, making thumbnails and all this other stuff that goes on. That's how fighters bring attraction to themselves. And in boxing, you know, one of the genius that was able to make it happen. I mean, you have to give Floyd Mayweather credit for milking the heck out of a freaking global heifer. Seriously, because that's exactly what he did. He was able to milk the heck out of the boxing game and convince the people that he was vulnerable enough 
to go in there and lose against Conor McGregor, who had an 0 no record. It was absolutely crazy. And that leads me to this point right now about fighters doing certain things for attention. We all know just recently in 2019, Conor McGregor was out in the streets doing whatever he wanted to do. And, you know, I have changed lanes from the freaking Julian Williams and Rosario. I would have liked that rematch to happen, but it isn't. So I'm moving on to my next topic. So we're getting all this information about Conor McGregor fighting somebody. When I say somebody, somebody in boxing. We already know he was due to step in there with Cowboy Cerrone. He stepped in the cage with Cowboy Cerrone and the fight was ending in 40 seconds, which in my opinion, all the fights I've watched with Cowboy Cerrone, it just didn't seem genuine. It seemed, it, it seemed almost like a stage play to me. It seemed like the Cowboy that I know that's full of extreme sports have been hurt and put in much worse conditions than he was in there from the bionic shoulder bumps you know what i'm saying i'm just being absolutely <laughs> genuine about saying that I, I didn't believe that fight the way it went down i did not believe it i didn't even believe it, it was so easily spread it the way it was the punishment spread it so easily with a butter knife no matter if if, if Don Cerrone was coming off two losses, the stuff that Conor McGregor was doing wasn't even something that's considered a blistering pace, you know, to inflict maximum punishment. I didn't even see that going in there. When he started doing those shoulder bumps, I said, okay, you know, they do that in boxing all the time. They do it in freaking mixed martial arts. That's nothing new. But since Conor McGregor, is one of those fighters who went to the pinnacle and they love to see him talk, talk, talk. They love to see the Irish hand grenade explode on his opponents and talk all that trash. They love it. He's out here in town doing whatever he's doing. So now I can I compare this to Tyson Fury. Now Conor McGregor is trying to get back in the good graces of the fans of the UFC because I'm I'm telling you, he's in the good graces of Dana White and them, but he's trying to get in the good graces of the UFC. Public audience. He's trying to convince people that he's still a superstar because he's going to attempt to finesse himself back into a title shot. This is the issue, though. He goes in there and does some, does some freaking shoulder bumps. And then try to land a uh, jumping knee or flying knee, whatever you want to call it. And Donald Cerrone, to his credit, early on when um, the fight just started, Cal and, and Connor threw that left hand and tried to get the fastest knockout in UFC history. Because deep down inside, I truly believe Connor McGregor thought he could knock him out in under five seconds. But Donald Donna Cerrone ducked. Um, he slipped it. He ducked under. And, um, you know, whatever he tried to do after that seemed like he miserably tried to go for a takedown. But no, you know, I mean, kind of sprawled just a tad bit. But people acting like he threw the punch, overcommitted, and then was able to quickly sprawl. That's showing his new and improved takedown defense. OK. He's, he wasn't Khabib. Cowboy Cerrone wasn't. Could be the Mega Met off. Anyway, when it got to the cage and Donald pushed him off, you know, after the flying knee didn't connect, um, Cowboy Cerrone committed to a, a right high kick. All right. That was returned by Conor McGregor's left, a left high kick from Conor McGregor that his toes hit the jawline of a Cowboy Cerrone. Wasn't the top of the foot a shin you know, just like Pete Williams, and Mark Coleman, you know, just like Valentina Shevchenko, Jessica I, Amanda Nunez, Holly Holmes. You know, there's been so many. Oh, I can even add Rashad, Rashad Evans to um Sol Sol Salman on uh, Salman, Sean Salman. I mean, knocked them out stiff. 
But what I'm trying to get at, I've seen Cowboy Cerrone take way more punishment than that before dropping to his knees. Now, this is where it starts playing with people's, you know, intelligence. Cowboy Cerrone right now, he gets in there in the post fight conference. This is the big talkative dude who's saying he'll beat anybody. I don't have to apologize, apologize to no one. He did not call out name specifics to, to making the fight happen. I didn't hear him call out Jorge Masvidal. I just didn't hear it. I didn't hear him call out Justin Highlight Gaethje, who's in a different division, but his name has been sh scrambled around the hat of potential opponents that would do pretty decent numbers. And he surely didn't call out Kamar Usman because Usman is somehow telling us that he went into the doctor and came out and he, he had a cask on. He don't know why, but it's BS. I just don't think Kamar Usman, you know, if anybody goes in there against Kamar Usman, I'm hoping they win. You know, because he's he's one of those champions that's always talking about he was only 30 percent and I'm a problem and I'm a problem. But he's not the most entertaining fighter. The same crap they said again about Tyrone Woodley, who was actually pretty in, entertaining. But when it comes to Conor McGregor and all his outside the ring antics and, and criminality, he's back in the eyes of the public of the UFC. And he's trying to ascend to that level of stardom that he had once before people. And he's doing that in a way to portray the interests of those who are close to him, those fans, betray as if he's a good guy. He's turned himself around, which I, I'm not saying he, he hasn't. I'm saying to me it still seems like it's, it's an act to basically swindle somebody into being on his side again. You know, you always have the bad guys, and then they do bad, you know, come in here and act like fools. And then they end up having to turn themselves around once it gets too bad for them to come back as the good guy. And that's what Conor McGregor is doing. You know, very pleasant press conference leading up to the fight with Cowboy Cerrone. You know, wasn't too much verbal back and forth obscenities. It wasn't out of control, you know, chaos by Conor McGregor like he usually do. Just total disrespect. That was, that was absent. The only really controversy of the press conference was one of the reporters asked him about the sexual assault case. That's it. And then everybody started booing and booing. And in my article, I, I spoke about how the crowd is so desensitized because these, these fans are so desperate. They're so desperate to have a superstar. You know, John Jones, he's coming off, you know, a fight where... He's going to be who he is. But John Jones isn't the personality of Conor McGregor. These fans, you know, they hear sexual assault and they're like, boo, boo. You know, they don't want to talk about it. But if by chance they was the, the co-defendant, they would absolutely be sending out a rescue team to find the best attorney in the land to help them out to sue Conor McGregor and get as much money as possible. That's where, you know, the mixed martial arts fans, and I, I would say sometimes combat sports in general, they just fall by the wayside when it comes to morals and principles. You know what I'm saying? I'm not saying they're supposed to hold the fighters to it. I'm saying themselves, they just overlook it due to the pay grade of the fighter. They want to live vicariously through that fighter, so they want to support them, and they want to make sure their voice is chiming the loudest amongst the, the, the rumbles when it's all in support of the fighter. And that's what happened. Conor McGregor didn't say anything, and he just let the crowd advocate for him, which is just it's crazy. It's, it's, it's so freaking – it shows that how gullible some of these fans are. Anyway – Conor McGregor really didn't call out anybody. And then all along leading up to the fight, we hear Conor McGregor Pacquiao. So we got media, you know, talking about Conor McGregor Pacquiao. And then after the fight, Floyd Mayweather put up McGregor, Floyd Mayweather 2020. 
And then as recent, Bob Aaron say Terrence Crawford, Conor McGregor. Everybody's trying, and I'm and, and believe me when I tell you this, this is not just by coincidence. This is all in a a um I wouldn't I wouldn't say tandem. I would say more so like a remote team effort to booster Connor to be this this superstar in the UFC. Like they really want to see him come back over to the boxing ring, knowing that he isn't gonna win. They just want to see him get on stage and and cater to the crowd, <clears throat> do um, perform his theatrics, talk his talk. And, and do the entertaining, you know, trash talking value. That's that's all they want to see. But for Terrence Crawford name to be in there, Pacquiao, Floyd Mayweather, some anybody and everybody. Do you believe you're going to get anything else out of Conor McGregor than you you saw in a 40 second knockout of a fighter who's been stopped before? I mean, I mean, he he's really, you know, he's he's sitting there, and the only thing he did different is he's closed the distance very quickly and tried to land a freaking left hand and knock Cowboy out. Cause he, if he could have got that three second knockout or four second, cause it's all about when the ref called the fight. If he could have somehow beat Jorge Masvidal's knockout of Ben Askren, then we're talking about. The doors of the skies of MMA opening up for Conor McGregor and be like, oh, my God, what just happened? What did we just see? That would have elevated him to the to, to the to the starlight that he's been looking for since he's been, you know, on this losing streak before that. Now that he went in there and defeated Cowboy Cerrone, it really don't do anything to the mainstreamers and purists who knows, you know, like we really don't freaking care about him going in there beating Cowboy Cerrone. We want to see a rematch between him and Khabib and the Mega Metal. Period. That's all we want to see. Because that was a fight just like the first fight at 170 when Nate Diaz, he got subbed out. You know, everybody was saying how technical and how much power he had, but it still goes to show you that he, he does have a deficiency in his all-around skill set as a mixed martial artist. Yeah, he went in there and watched Cowboy Cerrone, but it didn't it didn't it didn't provide us in a, any data. It didn't provide us any factual confirmations that he is a threat and he's the one to beat in that division. We can't say that because he's in a welterweight division right now. All right. So let me let me take you through because I always do the top 10. I like to do the top 10 like, you know, um, face the camera, you know. Or whatever, because I pretty much keep close to the top 10. But tonight, I just want to run it down to you. And I'm going to give you a basis of Conor McGregor being what he is without getting off track. <laughs> okay, number one is John Jones, right? Number two is undefeated lightweight champion could be the Mega Medoff. Number three is Henry Cejudo, who has been scheduled to vacate the 125-pound title and just be a bantamweight title holder. And, and give two other fighters the opportunity to, fa to fight for the vacated title. But right now, he is the champ champ. He's the, he's the flyweight champion and the bantamweight champion. Stipe Miocic, you know the story um, with him. He was um heavyweight champion, defended his title three times, knocked out in the first round by DC, and then returned and changed courses, I think, in the fourth round and started landing some, some punishing body shots to the Popeye's chicken eating Daniel Cormier and was able to knock a drumstick out of him and win his title back. Number five, Amanda Nunez. She's the bantamweight and featherweight champion. All right. She is the truth. You know, her last notable win in vicious fashion for a title was Chris Cyborg. I gave my take on that. I just didn't think Cyborg was one of those fighters who was um, buckled up for the long haul anymore in the UFC. So she wanted out. I've seen her fight much more disciplined than that. She, you know, once again, to the mainstreamers that know, she was kind of reminding me of when she fought Gina Carano 
it was extremely sporadic with no thought process to the pause factor in delivering and placing her shots correctly against a striker who could be much more effective in return or countering. But she was stopped in the first round. Six, DC. DC has lost both of his titles. He vacated the light heavyweight title, and then he his, his heavyweight title was, was returned back to Stipe Miocic. Why is he still in number six? Why is DC, who's close to retirement this year, so he say, is still in number six? I don't understand that. And I'm going to get to that because it's a lot of fighters that's on the back end of the um, the pound for pound list. Number seven, Israel Adesanya, the middleweight champion. He just defeated Robert Whitaker not too long ago. You know what I'm saying? And, you know, prayers go out to Robert Whitaker. You know, he has a daughter that's sick and he's trying to buy her a bone marrow. So he's going to be out. But, you know, prayers go out to him and his family. Israel Adesanya, you know, I always kind of dig with the with the with the mental shovel with this. And I, I, I truly believe that Robert Whitaker had a lot on his mind going into that fight. And he really didn't want to be champion again, being out in this particular case with his daughter being sick or having personal problems. And once again, this is how I read into it before the fights even happen. This is how I will own up to knowing certain things about that. And that, that's something that has nothing to do with studying. That's life. That's where it's been forever. And that's a whole nother, that's a whole nother freaking live. Anyway, Israel Asanya is middleweight champion. And I'm curious to see who he's going to fight next. Um, I mean, I pretty much understand who he's expected to fight in Yoel Romero, who fought Robert Whitaker twice and lost. So once again, social media. Israel Asanya took the social media to kind of throw some throw some spears at, at Yoel Romero, and they may potentially be fighting. If Israel Asanya go ahead and do what he has to do and defeat Yoel, he'll be a legit middleweight champion for real. Real talk. Eight is Kamar Usman. No comment. Nine, Alexander Vol Volkanovsky. He just defeated Max Holloway. And, you know, this guy's been on the radar, on the radar, flying, flying. And he was able to get that work in and um, put on a very superb performance against Max Holloway, who's, who's a hard worker. You know, Max Holloway was the featherweight champion, moved up to face Dustin Poirier for the vacant, like an interim title. And then they was going to face Khabib. He lost that to Dustin Poirier, who was just, you know, too big of a fighter. He, he did put up a valiant effort, but it wasn't enough. Now we get to the interesting part of the pound for pound list. Number 10 is Tony Ferguson, who, who hasn't lost in several years. Period. But he has been to a point of, of, of being an associate with four cancel bouts with Khabib and Omega Medoff. This is Tony Ferguson. Um, not too long ago in 2019 that, you know, the police had to be called and he was going through some issues, supposed to be some mental stuff and all that. And then I say just several days after that, they made it seem like it was nothing. You know, they they villa pinned it as if it was just what fighters do. He was having a bad day and that's it. But yet that wasn't what was coming out of his household. You know, whatever, you know, these are fighters. These are four ounce gloves. These are dudes who's being elbowed, kicked, everything, subbed. It's, it's a brutal sport. But anyway, he's sitting at number 10. OK, he's still waiting to get his shot. Now, what's strange enough is that Conor McGregor was sitting at number 15 all this time. He had freaking lost both of his titles, never defended one of them, similar to Tyson Fury, right? Similar to Andy Ruiz, similar to freaking Jessica Andre in the females freaking strawweight divisions being defeated by Jolly um, Wally Zhang. It just it, it puzzles me how he sat and sat at 15 and he lost to Nate Diaz, then avenged that when he, when he got that title, never defended it, 
went over the box and came back and fought Khabib, the lightweight champion, and lost. But he was still at 15. He was still at freaking 15. Now he's at 11. How is that puzzling to the outsiders? It's because if you're going to move from 15, where Tyrone Woodley is at, I'm just going to go down right quick. Valentina Shashenko, the flyweight champion, is 12. Max Holloway, he lost his title to um, Alexander Volkanovsky. He's 13. Dustin Poirier now, still vying for a title. Lost. Look, he, he, he defeated Max Holloway, but lost again to Khabib via submission. He's at 14. That's why it's basically suspect criteria that goes into this pound for pound list. 15 is Tyrone Woodley, who's lost his middleweight title, I mean his welterweight title to Kamar Usman. And really, what is there to say about him being back in the cage since then? Why is he still 15? I don't know. But check this out. Conor McGregor is ahead of Valentina Shevchenko, who's been the champion, who moved down from Bantamweight from her defeat of Mano Nunez twice and moved down to flyweight. And she's been champion. I think she's defended her title twice already. That brutal knockout of Jessica I. Left, left shin kick to the forehead. Concealed it very nicely. Very, very high level technical striking by Valentina Shevchenko. She's number 12 behind Conor McGregor who don't have a belt. It's something strange about how they keep treating her like that because Amanda Nunez was above Valentina Shevchenko even when she was just a bantamweight champion. You know what I'm saying? But the gap between Amanda Nunez and Valentina Shevchenko is astounding. It's six slots that separates them. And Valentina, the bully Shashenko, is one of the most entertaining freaking female fighters out there. Hands down. 13, Max Holloway. It is what it is, man. Um, he just lost his belt. They say I'm not going to push him off the list, but how can Max Holloway, who just lost his belt, and Dustin Poirier, who hasn't had a belt, still be 14th, and Tyrone Woodley had a belt. Shouldn't Tyrone Woodley be ahead of freaking Dustin Poirier? If anything, if we're talking about somewhat time frames of losing titles, Dustin Poirier never had a title, so he should be 15. Tyrone Woodley should be 14. Uh, you know, and, and the scrambling begins. But I just wanted to make note of how the list is right now with them trying to move Conor McGregor up the elevator in the presence of some of the top names that's in the UFC. Facts. That's facts, man. That is absolute facts. They want to move him closer and closer to the beat the Mega Madoff as possible. They want him somehow, some way to just take over they want him to ghost the president. They want him to appear up in the top 10 without anyone actually paying attention. But I pay attention to this list. I always do. You know, a lot of these fights, I can just go from 1 to 15 on this list and tell you why, uh, why they should and should not be where they're supposed to be on this list. They're trying to boost the Conor McGregor up for another big money grab. I'm telling you, they're working together to make this happen. They just don't know who to do it with. Are they going to be able to fall for another Floyd Mayweather and Conor McGregor? Do we need to put Terrence Crawford in there? Do we need Manny Pacquiao? I'm going to tell you right now, no Manny Pacquiao. The reason being is he's not a trash talker. Manny Pacquiao is a good guy. So for him to sell the fight to the fans, it'll just have to be those loyal Filipino boxing fans, which there's some of the best out there. And they will have to ha have, you know, of course, the Irish fans is going to support Conor McGregor. 
if they've if they've you know returned. But they're really trying to put pick up those strings, man, and put on a puppet show and, and, and try to see how many cheers they can get from the audience. Seriously, they really trying to do this boxing MMA again. But they need the right athlete to bring those millions in, man, to bring that star power to get Connor prepared for a run. They need the right dynamic. If Kamar Usman don't bring his behind back and defend his title, Dana White, I guarantee you he's going to freaking toss Kamar Usman on the freaking um, short bus and say, oh, we, we're going we're gonna to have an interim fight. What you think, who who you believe is going to fight for the interim title, waterway title? It's going to be Conor McGregor and somebody. They've been saying that Dana White has been wanting this fight with Jorge Masvidal and, and Conor McGregor for quite some time because the potential for it to make a lot of money is everything in its truest form. It's a lot of money that can be made in that, that fight. You have street fighting legend and Jorge Masvidal out the Florida waters in the south. Came up in the Kimbo Slice days. He's legitimate goon out the, out the south, man. You have uh, Conor McGregor, who is raised pretty good. You know what I'm saying? Um, play some sports. Relocated to a different part. And crumbling. Got in the boxing at 12. Um, and then changed over to mixed martial arts once he met this guy named Tim Egan. They started training mixed martial arts. Not really a, 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 a very colorful, freaking um, youthful growth period that he had as far as poverty and all that. Because I, re I remember just destroying cats on, on the MMA forums when they was when they was believing that Connor was from the streets and he was in poverty and he 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 should have been a kid that was on the commercial. If you just donate a nickel today, it will feed a Connor all day. If you just donate a nickel today in Ireland, it would go a long way. And you know they was putting up this storyline like he was from the streets, man. And that stuff was BS. Connor had a pretty decent two-parent home growing up. What the hell? What the heck they talking about? But now, at this point in his mixed martial arts career, man, if he can get a, get away with doing whatever he can, man, do it. If they want to fall for that Mayweather McGregor too, and they come up here and charge and charging you eighty nine ninety nine. And you go over there and say, oh, man, this is going to be good, man. Let's get a fight party together. Cool. You go do that. Seriously, you go do it. Because I'm definitely looking forward to some other fights in mixed martial arts than that right there. Not just in the UFC, but in, in Bellator and, and the PFL, all those other organizations that has fighters. That's pretty talented. So we, you know, we'll see how that play out, man. You know, it's it's just it's just crazy that, you know, can't, the story came out about Bob Aaron talking about Terrence Crawford. I'm just looking at this fight like, okay, the highest Terrence Crawford has fought is obviously 147. I'm just saying professionally, and and I'm looking at Conor McGregor. He's up at 170 right now. So. If if Terrence Crawford is not eagerly anxious to move up to 154 junior weight, then how will he step into the ring with Conor McGregor, who's fighting at 170 right now, and his last title fight was against Khabib and Mega Medoff at 155? It would have to be the junior middleweight, you know, limit, because Terrence Crawford, a welterweight right now he will have to move up at least to they're not going to have conor mcgregor's not going to dip down to to freaking welterweight i mean he looks down like skin on bones man they're gonna have to go up and, and have a junior middleweight freaking limit 
around 155, man. 154, 155. It, it's, it had to be close to what he fought Khabib Namega Medoff, which that weight class is 155. That's the only thing I can tell you on that. But Terrence Crawford stepping in there with Conor McGregor. I'm going to tell you, you know, Conor McGregor with boxing gloves on, to me, he didn't look as impressive as he does with four-ounce gloves. And I'm curious to know how much of a gentleman Terrence Crawford would even be with Conor McGregor. You know what I'm saying? He may not be as polite as Floyd Mayweather because Floyd Mayweather is a businessman. Floyd Mayweather is a genius. Not only just with his defense and his, his, his technical boxing mastery, he has found the ultimate metric in measuring the audience to load up for a huge pay, paycheck. He is that dude. Very, very business savvy. And people don't give him enough credit for what he's doing with the numbers. But I don't think Terrence Crawford would be that much of a gentleman. Um, you know, it'd probably be the biggest paycheck potentially that he's ever received. I don't know. If not, then something's wrong. But for him to go in there against Conor McGregor and for Bob Aaron to say that Terrence Crawford has a wrestling background. I told you all before, Terrence Crawford is athletic as hell. I mean, I've seen we've seen him play um, basketball. We I've seen him play Football run routes over there in Frisco. All right. He's very athletic. Make no mistake about it. But Conor McGregor, like I said before, he's fighting 170. And for Terrence Crawford to step in there with him, the press conference is going to have to be way different than what we see from Terrence Crawford. Very limited talking from him, all that. No, Conor McGregor will absolutely disrespect everybody that's around that's around terrence crawford he would disrespect everybody from the the parents down to the kids if he's still on that that heat because he's been acting like a good guy lately but the only thing about you cannot act like a good guy when you're trying to sell this fight to the boxing public you cannot be the good guy conor mcgregor has to be the same guy he was with Floyd Mayweather to sell this fight to the people. Nothing less. Because if you go in there and say less with Terrence, Terrence ain't going to say too much. And he's just going to be like, okay, you know, I'm, I'm getting ready for the fight. Let's go, man. You know, I don't have much to say. And that's how reserved he can be sometimes. But to sell this fight and bring in huge numbers and also shed more light on Terrence Crawford because Conor McGregor Believe it or not, Conor McGregor has much more eyes when it comes to star power than Terrence Crawford, period. You know, Terrence Crawford doesn't like the media that much. Man, Conor McGregor adores. <laughs> He's just freaking intoxicated by the media. He has to be near the mic. He want to be seen. You know what I'm saying? He wants everybody to believe the freaking crap he says all the time, man. If this is for real, I feel sharp. It's the fastest I ever been. And it's the best that I ever felt. Training was amazing. I mean, it seems like I'm a totally different fighter. And I can say nothing less. I'm going to go in there. I'm going to finish him. But see, the one thing about him saying what he said leading up to the Cerrone fight, that was possible. For him to go in there, that was absolutely possible, man. But it, it, those, those same words being in there with Khabib, it won't be the same energy. Seriously. He knows what lay ahead. He knows Khabib is a different type of animalistic killer. Khabib the Mega Medoff is relentless. He has that undeniable savagery that cannot be taught. Conor McGregor has experienced the asphyxiation of having Khabib the Mega Medoff on top of him raining down punishment, scooping his legs, restricting his movement, placing him on his back, not allowing him to get any type of transition 
or counters or any type of movement to get back to his feet. None of that. He felt it. To Connor's credit, like I always say, he didn't take a lot of punches while he was on he was on his seat by Khabib, but he took punishment enough to, to tire him out a different way, to deplete his energy, to set up that freaking fulcrum choke and sub him out in the fourth round. Savage. Predatorial. Conor McGregor knows deep down inside if he's to ever get back to that superstardom that he once had, he's going to he's gonna need to avenge that loss he has against Khabib to make a man off. Or if somehow, some way, Conor McGregor is able to go in here and win the welterweight title, he would have become a three-division champion but when it comes to him even facing the most freaking lethargic banal fighter in the damn organization almost besides Stephen Wonderboy Thompson and Darren Till that's Kamar Usman I don't think he can beat Kamar Usman period because the 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 um the advantages that Kobe Covington showed against Kamar was all standing we all know that Conor McGregor gasses. He has pinholes in his bagpipes. So he's going to have to go in there with a plan to, to, to exert that, 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 um, that punishment, his strikes, enough to try to, you know, inflict some damage and then take that time off to recover so he won't gas out. But if Kamar Usman fight him the way he did Tyron Woodley, press him up against the cage, get a takedown, it's going to be difficult for Conor to get off his back. But I don't know. Kamar might be lazy. I don't know. But he is a high-level wrestler for the UFC. You know what I'm saying? For UFC. Like, his wrestling ability is to be respected. So I'm not sure Conor McGregor can go in there and defeat Kamar Usman. I just don't see it. I just don't see it at all. You can't go in there and thinking a left hand is just going to be the stick of dynamite that you want to spark up every time that you go into a tough situation. I mean, no, it's a whole lot of other factors that you have to vary into that. One's wrestling ability, jujitsu. They're striking with legs, punches. I mean, kicks and punches, elbows, spinning techniques, and the overall mastery of getting your opponent to react. To what you have planned, your strikes. Because in mixed martial arts, you know, the fainting is much different than boxing. Yes, to get a reaction, but it's a it's a it's a lot, it's a lot more factors you have to be concerned about, like a takedown. You have to gauge your opponent's ground game to see how much of a um anxious, a compulsive reaction that you should give them. Just like Tyrone Woolley was in there with Damian Meyer. We know Damian Meyer is a BJJ world champion. So every time he was to shoot on Tyrone Woodley, Tyrone knew it was coming. He knew it was a dangerous game to play with the man they call Backpack. And that's why he took it seriously. All 23, 24 times that he had to stuff Damian Meyer's takedowns, so much to the fact that it tore his labrum. Real talk. Real talk. But you got to love mixed martial arts. You have to love boxing. You know, grappling, all that. What's next, man? Hey, you know, let's um, hope and pray. Back on the boxing. And this one I'm going to close out with. Let's hope and pray that um, somehow, someway, Dillian White gets an important opponent like Andy Ruiz. Now, we all know what happened with Andy Ruiz, them saying that he's been partying and he's not been to the gym and all that. So pictures have now anchored again in the media that he's back in the gym sweating it out. I don't know if his sweating is from training or it's freaking snicker grease. I really don't know what it is because 
when you go to lose weight, the first thing you really lose is the water weight. That's all. And then when it gets down to the percentage of body fat depletion, when the numbers start getting right and, you know, you start building muscle, that's when it gets harder and harder to lose weight. That's when you got to really start um, manipulating your diet and, and, and honing in and staying disciplined. Anyway, we're talking about Andy Ruiz here. So the only diet he has is caramel and nougat with nuts. So for Dillian White to potentially get a fighter who's coming off a poor, a very poor performance, he may be able to pick up a win against Andy Ruiz. Andy Ruiz may be very well suited or content with taking another loss because the paycheck is pretty decent. I'm pretty sure they're going to give Andy Ruiz some decent money. So for him to go ahead potentially against Dillian White and – I don't know what to say. I don't know who's benefiting from this. Uh, I can say Dillian White because he get to go in there with a former unified champion. Andy Ruiz ain't benefiting from facing no Dillian White. You know what I'm saying? I mean, Dillian White has one less defeat than Andy Ruiz. And that's from Anthony Joshua knocking him out in seven. So Andy Ruiz lost to Joseph Parker where a lot of people thought he won and then he he ended up losing a decision to Anthony Joshua. So when these two clash, if they do, I truly don't care who wins, to be honest. I would have liked to have seen Dillian White face Luis Ortiz or someone. That would have been better off for me. And then for Anthony Joshua facing Kubrat Pulev, you know, and, and they're trying to pick a um, venue for that. It is what it is, man. He got to face his IBF mandatory, whatever. You know what I'm saying? You know, donor freaking unification, freaking Trump's a freaking mandatory. You know, I mean, instead of them paying, a, paying attention to freaking intervening in Deontay Wilder trilogy with Fury, it would have been good to kind of break the, break the, um, go against the grain a little bit and try to get this unification. It would have been great. But who cares about Dillian White facing Andy Ruiz? Anthony Joshua facing Kubrat Pulev. We want to see the, we want to see what the what the um headlines read. He used a jab and grab. That's what that's what a headline, that's what a freaking article had. He jabbed and he grabbed. He jabbed and he grabbed. Now, some some casuals say that's boxing. But no, 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 no. We're talking about Anthony Joshua, the one that's supposed to have all this knockout power, who put out a post to say Deontay has a, le a, 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 a right hand and he has a left hand. But the one thing that he failed to, you know, to mention, Joshua, what about his chin? Because the grade of the chin between them two is no comparison compared to who's, who, who has been able to connect on Deontay Wilder and who's been able to connect on Anthony Joshua? That is lightweight, factual understanding with an exclamation point. Joshua Chin is suspect, just like Amir Khan and a lot of other people that hit the ground a lot of times. It's suspect. So the only thing we can say about 2020 is the back end of it. We hopefully some come to fruition in the in, in the in, in this heavyweight division. We're really not looking forward to seeing, you know, Anthony Joshua, if he's able to um, defeat Pulev, step in there with a smaller former unified champion in cruiserweight division, Alexander Usyk. I mean, why? It's so small, man. You know, like, were you going to give your titles up again just to just to help Usyk out because y'all – you know, you, you have respect for him. Oh, uh, yeah, let, let me lose my titles again. And then, you know, Usyk, uh, the same thing with Andy Ruiz. We're going to have a rematch. I'm going to get it so I can get three three time unified champion. OK, that 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 allows us to continue to roll the dice, loaded dice so we can always come up with the numbers that we want when we play ball. Over here. When we play ball over here, we already know 
what the table is going to be. The house is going to win. That's what we're looking for. I can help you out. You help me out. I lose the titles there, Alexander. It allows you to be the former, uni uh, former unified champion in cruiserweight, undisputed, and then move over here to heavyweight, be the freaking unified champion, and then let me get my titles back so I can be the three-time, so I can be put in the good graces of Muhammad Ali. Come on, man. It's a, it's a hustle every day. This keep getting the titles back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. You have one person that's going on his 11th defense who, who's basically grinding and, and basically putting in the credit hours in the ring to place himself in the company of scholars that was before him, the greats. And then you have another one that's in the perfect university where we've seen on TV where it's pretty much played out to the point on how they're going to go ahead and get this degree of notoriety. Absolutely. You think he won't lose his titles again so he can become a three-time heavyweight champion? You know what I'm saying? So he can start being considered something, a three-time three, three unified champion. Three-time three unified champion. Now that we can't be undefeated, let's go for history let's go for padding my body of work credentials and try to basically get membership amongst the company of the grace that's what we're working on and we need to sit down and plan this strategically to work out great so deontay wilder can go over here and be on his 13th 14th defense Anthony Joshua's busy over here losing the unified titles and winning them back the next time. Let's let's fight over here in this spot. And then when I when I rematch, I'm gonna try to have it on the moon. So we can get very little eyes for those who own a damn telescope, and we're gonna have it on the moon next time. That's so we don't have any controversy from the Freaking U.S. media saying the fight was fixed and all this other crap that goes on so they can sit up here and vilify and criticize. No, we want to have it on the moon. We're going to have to, you know, make sure the structure and everything is great. But that's going to be epic. We already done linked up with a couple of freaking UFO organizations up there. We have some freaking um, some aliens that are really trying to be on the undercard. So we're going to try to introduce that for the first time. If we can make that happen and they link up for the weight classes and convince them that they can go eight to ten rounds and the, the, their opponent's supposed to survive that's from another planet, then it may work out. If we can convince them not to kill one another for real, we can just put that on the zone. It'll be the first ever Heavyweight Space Odyssey Championship Extravaganza. Seriously. I mean, you might be laughing, but what do you expect? You don't see it? Like, the man is two-time unified champion already. You don't think it's possible for him to go over here and freaking lose the belt again and, and, and provide a, 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 another freaking fighter? A, a notch on their resume as becoming the heavyweight champion and then have an immediate rematch and the same shit happen? It's highly possible, man. But they're not going to have it somewhere where we can show up, where we can sit up here and critique and scrutinize it and see, you know, what's in theater and what isn't. No, we want to be there ringside. We want to have eyes on. Not going all the way over in the sand and see you run around the ring and, and toss a jab out there to Ruiz, who wasn't near as active as he was the first fight. It's just, it's just pointless, man. It's seriously pointless. So anyway, it's always a pleasure up here talking to the to the to the fighters. Um, I'm trying to get this interview. If I'm if I'm able to get this interview with this female um, fighter, 
Um, not to give away too much. Um, it's going to be another hitter. You know what I'm saying? Because I definitely, you know, hope that I'm able to set this up to address some of the concerns that's out here in the media with her potentially fighting another female fighter out here. <laughs> I got some questions, man. I got some serious questions. It's 2020. You know what's going on. You know, we're in a different gear this year, World Combat Sports. We, that means me, myself, and I. He is me, and me is him, and any bad English you want to talk about. You know what I'm saying? We lift, we shifting gears in 2020. We're doing a lot of stuff behind the scenes, you know, for whoever want to support, that's cool. You know, you can follow me on all social media platforms. It's always a pleasure. Next time I'm on live, y'all can drop your input in there. Don't be scared. You know what I'm saying? I know y'all smart, intelligent boxing, combat sports aficionados. You drop your input in there, man. I like interacting with the um the supporters it's all good follow me on youtube of course grow the channel subscribe to the channel follow me on ig until next time i will be back on here to talk a little bit later i think you know because danny garcia is popping off this week he's facing ivan ivan recotch so I definitely want to show DSG some love, man. Even though the fight is not getting that much freaking rave and, and energy, um, it's going down. You know what I'm saying? It's a it's a fight card that's happening this weekend. So um, be sure to turn up and tune in to World Combat Sports.